So you have a big problem. There is evil all around you. And if you believe in God, you want to know why an all good, powerful, and loving God would allow this evil. And whether or not you believe in God, you want to know how to face evil, how to live in response to it. Now, everyone struggles with this question of evil, whether they know it or not. Their answer to it is not only in their words, but in how they live. And Dostoevsky addresses evil more deeply than any other author or philosopher. So in this video, let me begin by playing an excerpt from Book 5, Chapter 3 of the Brothers Karamazov, in which Ivan powerfully describes evil in this world. Now, Ivan's conclusion is not that God does not exist, but that there is no possible justification for this type of evil, and so he wants no part in God's plan. And even if there is a justification, he wants no part in this plan that includes this type of evil. So let's take a listen. This poor child of five was subjected to every possible torture by those cultivated parents. They beat her, thrashed her, kicked her for no reason, till her body was one bruise. Then they went to greater refinements of cruelty, shut her up all night in the cold and frost in a privy, and because she didn't ask to be taken up at night, as though a child of five, sleeping its angelic sound sleep, could be trained to wake and ask, they smeared her face and filled her mouth with excrement, and it was her mother, her mother, did this, and that mother could sleep, hearing the poor child's groans. Can you understand why a little creature, who can't even understand what's done to her, should beat her little aching heart with her tiny fist in the dark and the cold, and weep her meek, unresentful tears to dear, kind God to protect her? Do you understand that, friend and brother, you pious and humble novice? Do you understand why this infamy must be and is permitted? Okay, so that is the first example of child suffering that Dostoevsky writes about through the character of Ivan. Here is a second example, and keep in mind that this hasn't gone away. There are children suffering in this way all around the world. There was in those days a general of aristocratic connections, the owner of great estates, one of those men, somewhat exceptional, I believe, even then, who retiring from the service into a life of leisure are convinced that they've earned absolute power over the lives of their subjects he has kennels of hundreds of hounds and nearly a hundred dog boys all mounted and in uniform one day a serf boy a little child of eight threw a stone in play and hurt the paw of the general's favorite hound why is my favorite dog lame he is told that the boy threw a stone that hurt the dog's paw so you did it the general looked the child up and down take him he was taken taken from his mother and kept shut up all night early that morning the general comes out on horseback with the hounds his dependents dog boys and huntsmen all mounted around him in full hunting parade the servants are summoned for their edification and in front of them all stands the mother of the child the child is brought from the lock-up it's a gloomy cold foggy autumn day a capital day for hunting the general orders the child to be undressed the child is stripped naked he shivers numb with terror not daring to cry make him run commands the general run run shout the dog boys the boy runs at him yells the general and he sets the whole pack of hounds on the child the hounds catch him and tear him to pieces before his mother's eyes i believe the general was afterwards declared incapable of administering his estates well what did he deserve to be shot to be shot for the satisfaction of our moral feelings speak alyosha to be shot murmured alyosha lifting his eyes to ivan with a pale twisted smile bravo cried ivan delighted if even you say so you're a pretty monk so there is a little devil sitting in your heart alyosha kalamazov okay let me jump in here Dostoevsky is a master of describing evil, but he cannot understand it. He admits that it may be because he has a puny brain, as all humans do, and that we cannot understand why God allows such evil. Now, 
in philosophy, we study something called the argument from evil. And this is the idea that God probably doesn't exist because there's so much unnecessary suffering, so much evil in the world. There's also this idea that if God exists, then he's not all powerful because he would stop the evil, or he's not all good, he would have stopped the evil, or he's not all knowing, he doesn't know about it. So for thousands of years, philosophers and theologians have discussed what are called theodicies. And theodicies are attempts to explain why an all good, powerful, and loving God would allow this type of suffering in children this type of evil. The main one is the free will theodicy, which is roughly the idea that God allows evil so that we can have free will instead of being robots. A world with free will is just much better to freely choose love, for example. And there's a mountain of literature on this theodicy, on this attempt to explain why such evil exists. If you look back at the book of Job, the people sitting around Job are giving theodicies, attempts to explain why he's suffering. Now, another theodicy is the soul-making theodicy, or the person-making theodicy, which is roughly the idea that God allows evil for the same type of reason that metal is thrown into the fire, and it's thrown into the fire to forge it into something good, like a sword. So, if there were no danger, we could not develop the virtue of courage. If there were no selfishness, we could not choose real love. So, evils exist so that we may develop these virtues. Now, of course, there are many objections to this soul or person-making theodicy, and much has been written. You could also think of the many people creating religions or discovering them, um, or discovering heretical ideas. They are trying to explain why there is evil. So Manichaeanism, for example, posits the idea that there's an evil power equal to God. And so the reason there is evil is because God or goodness is not sovereign. There's an evil power constantly at war with the good. Now, in the end, though, Dostoevsky recognizes that all of these theodicies, all of these theodicies for an all-powerful God reduce to this. There is some future harmony that we cannot really understand that will wipe away all the tears and make everything right. There's some greater good or future harmony that oh, maybe you think you can understand or maybe you don't. You just have faith that God has a deeper reason. Now, of course, Ivan cannot accept this. In his mind, nothing can make right this individual case of suffering, this child being torn apart. Even if a greater intellect has a justification, Ivan rejects it, for there are more important things than intellectual justifications. Nothing can justify this child's suffering. Nothing can make it right. So let's listen a bit more to Ivan Alyosha's conversation. I understand nothing, Ivan went on, as though in delirium. I don't want to understand anything now. I want to stick to the fact. I made up my mind long ago not to understand. If I try to understand anything, I shall be false to the fact, and I have determined to stick to the fact. And what becomes of harmony if there is hell? But then there are the children, and what am I to do about them? That's a question I can't answer for the hundredth time i repeat there are numbers of questions but i've only taken the children because in their case what i mean is so unanswerably clear listen if all must suffer to pay for the eternal harmony what have children to do with it tell me please it's beyond all comprehension why they should suffer and why they should pay for the harmony why should they too furnish material to enrich the soil for the harmony of the future i understand solidarity in sin among men i understand solidarity in retribution too but there can be no such solidarity with children and if it is really true that they must share responsibility for all their father's crimes such a truth is not of this world and is beyond my comprehension some jester will say perhaps that the child would have grown up and have sinned but you see he didn't grow up he was torn to pieces by the dogs at eight years old oh alyosha i am not blaspheming i understand of course what an upheaval of the universe it will be when everything in heaven and earth blends in one hymn of praise and everything that lives and has lived cries aloud thou art just o lord for thy ways are revealed when the mother embraces the fiend who threw her child to the dogs and all three cry aloud with tears thou art just o lord 
then of course the crown of knowledge will be reached and all will be made clear but what pulls me up here is that i can't accept that harmony while there is still time i hasten to protect myself and so i renounce the higher harmony altogether it's not worth the tears of that one tortured child who beat itself on the breast with its little fist and prayed in its stinking outhouse with its unexpiated tears to dear kind god it's not worth it because those tears are unatoned for they must be atoned for or there can be no harmony but how how are you going to atone for them is it possible by their being avenged but what do i care for avenging them what do i care for a hell for oppressors what good can hell do since those children have already been tortured i want to forgive i want to embrace i don't want more suffering and if the sufferings of children go to swell the sum of sufferings which was necessary to pay for truth then i protest that the truth is not worth such a price i don't want the mother to embrace the oppressor who threw her son to the dogs she dare not forgive him let her forgive him for herself if she will let her forgive the torturer for the immeasurable suffering of her mother's heart but the sufferings of her tortured child she has no right to forgive she dare not forgive the torturer even if the child were to forgive him and if that is so if they dare not forgive what becomes of harmony is there in the world a being who would have the right to forgive and could forgive i don't want harmony from love for humanity i don't want it i would rather be left with the unavenged suffering i would rather remain with my unavenged suffering and unsatisfied indignation even if i were wrong besides too high a price is asked for harmony it's beyond our means to pay so much to enter on it and so i hasten to give back my entrance ticket and if i am an honest man i am bound to give it back as soon as possible and that i am doing it's not god that i don't accept alyosha only i most respectfully return him the ticket tell me yourself i challenge you answer imagine that you are creating a fabric of human destiny with the object of making men happy in the end giving them peace and rest at last but that it was essential and inevitable to torture to death only one tiny creature that baby beating its breast with its fist for instance and to found that edifice on its unavenged tears would you consent to be the architect on those conditions tell me and tell the truth no i wouldn't consent said alyosha softly and can you admit the idea that men for whom you are building it would agree to accept their happiness on the foundation of the unexpiated blood of a little victim and accepting it would remain happy for ever no i can't admit it okay so this chapter that you just listened to is one of the most profound in literature and philosophy and at this point, Alyosha admits that he could not accept happiness if it depended on that one child's suffering, on the unexpiated blood of a little victim. But he says there's one being, Jesus Christ, who has the right to forgive and can forgive. He gave his innocent blood. So in the next great chapter, called The Grand Inquisitor, Ivan will now address this Jesus Christ issue. He tells a very creative story that we'll address in the next video. But in the end, Alyosha's answer, it's not an intellectual answer. The answer to evil is not an intellectual one. There is no intellectual answer. If you take one hour to read with the peasants, the world will open up. We are much more than rational creatures. And there is no rational answer to the argument from evil or to the argument that Ivan is presenting. The answer instead is a kiss. It's a way of life and something deeper than the intellect something deeper than the intellect can understand. 
To better understand, we must look at the next chapter called The Grand Inquisitor, one of the great stories in literature and philosophy, and then at Book 6, The Russian Monk, in which Dostoevsky describes this really beautiful, loving man, Zosima.